Alright, coming in at number 10, we have the homunculus theory from Cars. Sure. I actually wasn't ready for this. Like, why, why, why do theorizey people with their brains need to go around making disturbing theories? Why can't they just enjoy movies? Why? So, Disney Pixar's Cars is a great film. I love it. It's set in an alternate kind of universe where humans don't exist or they don't seem to. Maybe they did one day in the past, but they aren't around anymore. We never meet a human. The only sentient beings seem to be the cars themselves. And boats. I did see some boats. But mainly, it's cars. Hooray for cars. Cars as far as the eye can see. Cool. Weird, but you know, it's a movie, so let's just let it go. Which is what some people should have done. Unfortunately, though, some people pointed out that if this is the case, if there are no humans around, then why do the cars have windows, door handles, mirrors, and a steering wheel? These are functions made for humans. Well, the theory goes that humans are actually living inside the cars, and the car outer shell is like a strange exoskeleton. Do you remember the tiny alien in the person's head in Men in Black? It's a bit like that, but creepier. Someone has drawn a physiological diagram of what this would look like, and honestly, I don't like it. You can read pages and pages and pages of theory, and honestly, we don't have time for the disturbing ins and outs, but I'll leave you with this. In the theory, they say that humans are lab grown in amniotic vats and then embedded within an automotive exoskeleton. Coming in at number nine, Carl was dead all along in Up. There is one super sad and morbid theory out there that goes that Carl, the lovely grumpy old man, died the night after the courts tell him he has to leave his home in his sleep. Everything else is said to be his adventure to heaven to be with his dead wife, Ellie. Russell is said to be his guardian angel. Angel, but an angel in practice who needs to earn his wings. In the movie, he needs a badge for assisting the elderly to become a senior wilderness explorer. Now, the theory says that Carl's guardian angel is a child because he and Ellie were never able to have one. So sad. The house that Carl and Russell fly away in is said to represent Carl's physical attachment to the present world, and floating up is said to represent his transformation from the real world to the spirit world. Paradise Falls in the movie is said to be the gates of heaven, which Carl eventually reaches. Was he dead this whole time? It seems the theory started on Reddit and ballooned from there. Pardon the pun, I'm honestly just trying to quell my pain with humor. Coming in at number eight, Boo grows up to be a witch. This is a Monsters Inc. and Brave collaboration theory. Right, so this one involves time travel and a bit of a stretch of the imagination, but bear with me. So basically I never thought that cute little Boo would turn out to be the witch in Brave. Like what? It seems that there is an easter egg in Brave that has got people cooking up a terrifying theory. It seems that there's a wood carving of a monster that looks a lot like Sully in the witch's cabin. Boo and the witch do after all have the same colour eyes. So basically the theory goes that Boo spent her life looking for Sully, which led her to go through through many, many doors, a la Monsters Inc. In the end, one door took her to the past, and she learned to time travel. Remember the scene in Brave when the witch goes through a door and disappears? Is it Boo? She'd know how to do this. There are further suggestions that the witch has seen the future. She carves a pizza van from wood. Again, she carves the Sully. Maybe she's looking for him, allegedly. Honestly, I can't fathom Sweet Boo being a baddie, but good theory. Coming into number seven, we have another Monsters Inc. theory. This one is like a collaboration with Monsters Inc. and Toy Toy Story is Randall, Andy's monster. In the first and second Toy Story movies, Andy is the perfect age for a monster. In Monsters Inc, monsters go around scaring kids just like Andy to help generate power. Now we know that Disney and Pixar love a good easter egg, and if you look closely, it seems they may have dropped a hint about what goes bump in the night in Andy's room while his toys are sleeping, or motionless. This theory was pointed out by the Super Carlin brothers, who I absolutely love. Have a look at this. Now, this does look a lot like Andy's famous cloud wallpaper, does it not? Also, is this Andy's door in the door lineup? Randall may have been Andy's monster all along. Ugh. Randall. Coming into number six, Andy's dad was murdered, another Toy Story theory. So we've had a bit of news about this from the Disney Pixar camp, but before we talk about what may have been confirmed or denied, I want to talk about this worrying theory. It seems that a fan of the franchise on Reddit posted that they thought Andy's dad, who we never meet, is dead. It wouldn't be surprising, would it, knowing that Disney is basically the parent killers of the ages. Like, dead, dead, dead. Always dead. At least one parent dead, anyway. So the theory goes that Andy's dad was a police officer, but 
but he was shot and killed on duty, hence Andy's obsession with male authority figures. We see Andy and his family move home, maybe this is because of his dad's death. Another theory says that he died from polio, but Toy Story creator Andrew Stanton wrote that this was actually complete and utter fake news. What is going on with his dad then? Tell us Andy, Andrew, Stanton. Coming into number 5, Wally is actually evil. I actually honestly refuse to believe this one. This is pretty long and it's like quite intense to go into. I just don't want to believe it as well because Wally is so cute. Nonetheless, a number of fans out there have pointed out that it is almost impossible for the Earth to become overrun by trash by accident. Some fans say that the Wally unit went rogue and destroyed all of the other Wally units over a 700 year murder spree. Apparently, this is why there is so much waste. There's only one robot around, and we see him cannibalizing parts of his fellow units at the beginning of the movie. Wally can't be a murderer, can he? Coming in at number four, Toy Story is an allegory for the Holocaust. Dustin Hoffman of UGO actually drew some pretty convincing parallels between the Holocaust and Toy Story 3. They argue that the toys are a symbol of the Jewish people who were left behind by the Allies in World War II. The toys, as you will remember, try to seek refuge in the attic, striking a reference to Anne Frank. In the end, they are offloaded to the Sunnyside Daycare Center, which turns out to be a lot like a prison or a concentration camp. There's then the whole incinerator scene which Hoffman links to the final solution and the death camps. Pretty heavy and terrifying stuff. In the end, the toys are saved by well doing aliens. Now, a lot of Jews were actually freed from concentration camps at the end of the war, although, of course, six million weren't. Some fans who have jumped on the Toy Story Holocaust bandwagon have gone as far as to say that. Actually, the toys did die in the incinerator, and the alien rescue is actually their journey to the afterlife. What about Toy Story 4 then? I don't know. Coming into number three, Nemo from Finding Nemo is dead. Hmm. In a Sixth Sense style plot twist, some people think that Nemo is dead. Now, according to a popular internet theory, Nemo also died when his mum was killed in the shark attack at the beginning. Basically, Nemo's mum and all of their eggs were killed at the very beginning of the movie, except for one. Nemo. Basically, though, the theory says that it was all in Marlin's head, and in an attempt to cope with the tragedy, he imagined one of the eggs was left. Now he dreams up Nemo, a dependent fish who, in theory, would never leave him, but it all goes wrong. Such are the lows of depression. In the end, Marlin accepts his grief. Apparently, Nemo means nothing in Latin, and some theorists basically went from there. We have another Finding Nemo theory up next. This one is actually even more horrifying. So, kids, please close your ears for the love of all things. Holy. Coming into number two, Nemo would have had sex with his. Actually, do you know what? I just can't say it. I'm not gonna say it. I won't. So basically, this is both a theory and a biological fact. Nemo is a clownfish. All clownfish are born as hermaphrodites with both sexual organs. They develop into male or females depending on their social experience. And in the clownfish world, females are dominant. Who run the world? Female clownfish, that's who. But basically, they can also change sex when need be. It seems if Nemo's mum had died, Marlin, his dad, would have turned into a female to become more dominant and protect his offspring. Then his dad turned mum and Nemo would have mated because fish don't understand incest. Then if Nemo's dad slash mum had died, Nemo would have changed into a female and mated with another male. Cool. Sometimes science is scarier than a horror movie. Finally, coming into number one, we have the dead friends theory. There is a lot of Toy Story in this list, but let's face it, Toy Story is the most popular Pixar creation and there are three of the movies soon to be four. So as we know in the world of Toy Story, toys drop down motionless when humans come into a room. Humans play with the toys and the toys pretend not to be sentient. Well, have you ever thought about this? Illumise wrote on Tumblr, if the toys in Toy Story died, the kids would keep playing with them like normal, but the other toys would be playing with their dead friends. What the hell? Honestly, what the hell indeed? My question is though, can toys in Toy Story die? Like if they're dropped from a great height? with that killer toy? Like probably not, so unless they're burnt like they almost were, how can they die anyway? Although I think back and I remember the mutant toys, like I guess that's pretty messed up. Sid was a horrible, horrible kid. They're kind of like living corpses, a bit human centipede but in Toy Story, this is so dark and none of them can speak. So dark. Honestly, Pixar, you've done it again. Starting off this countdown, we have the terrible situation. So according to this Disney employee, this incident took place on the 4th of July in 1995. On that day, there was a power glitch and all of the rides shut down at the same time. So all of them had to be evacuated, but that led to a pileup at the park. 
park. Everyone started panicking and trying to get out, especially this one guest who pulled out something sharp from their bag and started and guests so that they could get out of the park. Thankfully, I don't think anyone died that day, but still, what a traumatic thing that they had to go through. In our ninth spot, we have the injuries. One Disney employee shared on Reddit how rough it truly is to be a Disney mascot character. I mean, not only do they have to wear those costumes out in the blazing heat, but they also have to deal with whiny and bratty children and parents. And apparently, a lot of the time, they get injured. One time, a family attacked Pluto and pushed the character into the fountain. The employee suffered from a broken arm. In another instance, a woman playing Mickey Mouse suffered a bad neck injury after a guest kept patting her on the head. This caused the head to fall down and strain her neck. And the costumes themselves weigh 47 pounds. They're blamed for at least 282 injuries. So maybe just be gentle with them. But before I go any further, if you guys are liking this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Come on, you know the drill, because it really helps us out. In our eighth spot, we have the working conditions. It's no shock that landing a job at Disney is very, very hard. Every year they receive thousands upon thousands of applications, but Here's the thing, if you do land a job at Disney, you have to be very, very careful because you can easily be fired. Here's a list of ways you could get fired. For starters, you could get fired for coming to work looking unacceptable. Workers always have to have their facial hair neat and trimmed. Their nails always have to be trimmed back and they can't have any visible piercings. They are super strict about this all. You can also get fired if you post something bad on social media about the company, if you're a face actor and you gain weight, or if you talk while in your costume. I mean, the last one I get, I don't want to be hugging Winnie the Pooh and then hear some old man talking. Anyways, this one employee said that he was fired from Disney after being caught eating a piece of pop that fell on their shirt. That's insane. I would be fired instantly if that's the case because I make a mess while I'm eating and then I just always eat the crumbs off my shirt. Sorry, not sorry. It's just scary how controlling Disney is over their employees. Moving on to number seven, we have the Disney point. Here's another ridiculous thing that Disney employees must do. No matter what, they always have to point with their index finger and middle finger. They can't point with just one finger because that's thought to be rude. So whenever they're showing people directions or something, they always have to point with two fingers. In fact, you could be fired if you're caught pointing with one finger. Coming in at number six, we have the bullying. Now, working at Disney is often thought of as a dream job. There are so many characters that aspire to be a character at Disney. I hate to break it to you, but apparently the work environment is fairly toxic. According to multiple employees, there's a lot of bullying that takes place behind the scenes, especially when it comes to the character actors. So there is a sense of hierarchy there. The girls that played the recent popular Disney princesses like Anna and Elsa are thought of as top tier. They're at the top of this Disney social pyramid. Then we have the actors that play the older characters like Snow White, Mary Poppins, Gaston, Peter Pan, you get it. And at the bottom of the pyramid are the mascot characters. Apparently the mascot characters are treated so poorly by other cast members. So yeah, I don't know if I would ever want to work there. Like I like teamwork and cooperation, not rivalry. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the water. So if you've been to Disney, then you know some rides are surrounded by water. According to employees, that water, although it may not look like that, is extremely polluted and filthy. From people throwing up in there, to trash, to animal poop, it's got it all. And I don't know how often it gets clean. If it looks clean to them, then it's good enough. So maybe think twice before getting on a ride that sprays you with water. In our fourth spot, we have the costumes. So in my last video, I talked about how some of the bigger and elaborate mascot costumes can't really get washed. So instead, they just spray it with disinfectant. Well, here's a fact that will gross you out even more. Back in the day, cast members at Walt Disney had to obviously share costumes, but they also had to share undergarments. Until 2001, each costume had their own Disney sanctioned undergarments that they would have to share with each other. So gross. Because of that, a lot of workers were passing around STIs and STDs and 
stuff. So th that's when they stop sharing underwear. Like that is highly, highly unsanitary and I'm glad that's not a thing anymore. Moving on at number three, we have the alligator problem. So once upon a time, Disney had a really bad alligator problem. They still kind of do, but obviously they didn't want park guests to worry about this. So they kept downplaying this problem. From 2006 to 2015, 220 alligators had to be removed from Disney World. Then from 2015, 2016, there was a massive increase of gators at the park. Since Disney is connected connected to waterways that intersect with lakes and rivers, alligators have an easier access to Disney than they admitted. That's when Disney was exposed for downplaying the seriousness of their alligator problem. Now they are taking it seriously and have increased their safety measures. Coming in at number two, we have the dead body. So here's a fun fact. There is a dead body at Disneyland. Well, kind of, let me explain. So according to employees back in the day when the Pirates of the Caribbean ride was being built, they decided to use real human bones. Why? Because they thought that the fake bones looked too thick. Didn't look real enough. So they brought in real ones. Apparently they got these bones from UCLA Medical School. The real bones were used for a while, then eventually they were swapped out for fake ones. But the skull and crossbones featured in the ride behind a skeleton lounging in bed are still real. And in our number one spot, we have the cursed ride. Now, according to multiple different employees, the haunted mansion ride is actually cursed. So it all started back in the day when a visitor died on the ride. At one point, he stood up to try and reach a part of the attraction, but ended up falling off the ride and plummeted to his death. Other eerie things have happened there that have led them to believe the ride is cursed. Like how in Disneyland Paris, a worker was found dead at their Phantom Manor ride, which is basically like the Haunted Mansion ride at Disney World. His body was found two days later after his death. His cause of death was apparently electrocution. Still, they think this is all because of the Haunted Mansion ride curse. To make matters worse, the ride uses an authentic 14th century spell book containing real spells. So yeah, maybe this curse has something to do with that. Starting off this countdown, we have the secret tunnel system. I know I've talked about this before, but Walt Disney created a whole underground tunnel system for the characters to have a break. And it's for them to secretly get around the park without walking everywhere in costume. This way, this all preserves the magical feel of Disney. But some employees shared what really goes on down there. First off, they said that the tunnel system is fairly confusing, and on a number of occasions, people have gotten lost down there. One employee said that they had just got a job playing a Disney mascot character and went down into the tunnels and had no clue where to go. He went to ask other employees for help, but since he was new, they kind of just brushed him off. Another employee revealed that some of the cast members like to get it on during their breaks down in the tunnel system. So while you're up above having fun, they're down below having fun, just in a different way, if you understand what I'm getting at. Coming in at number nine, we have the waiting lines. But before I go any further, if you guys are liking this video so far, make sure to give it a big thumbs up because it really helps us out. I think the one flaw about Disney are its lines. Seriously, nobody's got time for that. But a couple of years ago, a huge scandal broke out involving Disney and their waiting lines. Basically, rich families were paying tour guides that have access to these special passes for the disabled. Basically, with this pass, you get brought right to the top of the line because Disney wants guests with disabilities to have a great time. But wealthy, able people were abusing this, which is absolutely sickening. Can't believe people were actually doing this just to scam the system. Moving on to number eight, we have the overnighter. For this next point, let's move back along to Disney's tunnel system. So remember I talked about how new employees often get lost down in the tunnels? Well, there's this creepy urban legend about this happening to a new employee. So he finished his shift and went down to the tunnels to change. As he was making his way out, the lights in the tunnel shut off and he was in the complete darkness. Now he had trouble already finding the exit with the lights on. Now with the lights off, it was even more difficult. He ended up wandering around the tunnel system for hours before collapsing from exhaustion. He ended up staying there overnight. His coworkers found him in the morning. He was freezing cold and super scared. So now this story is kind of used to scare new employees. In our seventh spot, we have the suspicious death. 
So in 2012, a man's body was found near the Mickey and Friends parking structure at Disneyland. Please just assume the man took his own life, but no witnesses ever reported seeing this man jump. Now what's weird is that I tried to search more into this case, but I couldn't find anything. We don't know what truly happened to this man and how he passed away which is a little suspicious to me. In our sixth spot, we have Yes Man. So this story was shared by a former Disney employee that worked near the Indiana Jones ride. So his job was to dress up as an adventurer and just stand around. But he said he was often attacked by kids and Disney told him that he just kind of had to take it. So these kids would often be super psyched to go on this ride. And so they were in costume and had plastic weapons. He said on a number of occasions, kids would come up to him and literally whip him with their weapons. Or he would get asked to duel and he always had to say yes. So kids would just be jabbing him with their plastic swords. Yeah, that's not a job I would like. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Winnie the Pooh gets sued. I thought that was so clever. Like I was typing that and I came up with that. And I'm like, pat on the back. Good job, Lindsay. Anyway, in 1978, a guest at the park sued Disney and a cast member, claiming that the cast member playing Winnie the Pooh slapped their daughter. In 1981, their case was brought to court and the cast member showed up in the Winnie the Pooh costume. He argued that their daughter was tugging on his costume. He turned around and accidentally knocked her over. And then in court, he proceeded to show the jury his costume's arms, saying it's not even physically possible for him to do that in the first place, you know, with his little limited movement. In the end, Disney ended up winning, but still, what a wild day at court. And I love how he showed up in costume. Coming in at number four, we have the deadly ride. On June 26, 2007, a female guest passed away on the rock and roller coaster of Vec Aerosmith ride at Disneyland Paris. After the ride was done, people noticed her unconscious. The paramedics arrived, but failed to revive her. Sadly, she passed away. Now in articles, it said that the ride wasn't going to reopen until they found out how and why she passed. But there's no follow-up articles outlining what went wrong on the ride. And it's not like she was 80 years old and had health conditions. No, she was fairly young. I just wish Disney let us know what happened because the ride has been up and running ever since, but no official statement was ever released. In our third spot, we have Disney's jail. Did you know that Disney has its own specific jail for criminals? Yeah, if you're caught breaking any of Disney's rules, you'll be escorted to Disney jail. Employees describe it as an underground room with bars on the windows. There's no bright colors or Mickey's decorating the area. Now, what causes you to be sent to Disney jail? Well, if you get too rowdy or too intoxicated at the park, if you smoke certain substances at the park, or if you're caught shoplifting, you, you get the picture. Disney is actually very strict when it comes to this. People caught shoplifting aren't even given a warning sometimes. Instead, they're just sent straight to their jail. From there, you can be fined, kicked out of the park, banned from ever coming back to the park, or all of the above. In our second spot, we have Blake Lively's arrest. Believe it or not, but actress Blake Lively was once sent to Disney jail. Yeah, so basically her and her brother both snuck into Disneyland's park. What they did is put hairspray on the stamps of somebody that came out of the park and then put their hands together and that transferred the stamp. Then they got to go in the park for free. Except Blake and her brother were caught by an undercover Disney cop and sent to Disney jail. I'm telling you, Disney has way too many undercover cops. Like they're everywhere, which is a good thing for safety, but also kind of a bad thing because you know, they're watching your every move. And in our number one spot, we have the battle. This story comes from a Disney employee that worked at a store at the Disney park near the Indiana Jones ride. One time, 30 kids ran into the store and each grabbed a toy sword from the bin, you know, so that they could be just like Indiana Jones. But then the kids started attacking the two workers in the store with their swords. And obviously the workers aren't allowed to like yell at the kids or panic or fight back. So they just let the kids attack them until their parents noticed and called them off. By then he says his arms were already covered in cuts and bruises and he was bleeding. Yeah, maybe those weapons should be like placed behind the counter or something, you know, so things like that don't happen. Or maybe Disney should just have a better policy. I don't know. Mm -hmm. 